Would you introduce yourself, please? I'm so honored to. Well, sir, thank you very much for being here. Are there any other non-fire service folks here? All right, so most of them are my brothers and sisters, but I think I'm going to be talking to you the most, if it's all right. <laughs> so this, this actually is a presentation I've been working on for the past several years, and it's really designed mostly not for the fire service. So I know a lot of fire service folks are in here, but it really is more designed for elected officials, community leaders, business leaders, people that are not familiar with the fire service. So keep that in mind as we go through this. So some of the stuff may be repetition for some of you, but for the councilman here, hopefully there'll be some new ideas and some new, new direction, because the basic idea that I've come to after all this time in the fire service is that if we really wanna change the American fire problem, we, the fire service, cannot do it alone. The rest of society kind of creates the problem that we have to respond to. So if we want a different thing to respond to, we have to get them to help us fix the issues. So that's the approach that I'm trying to take. And as you can see, it's very difficult to get other people's attention. We have one out of all the possibility of all the people that could hear this presentation, most fire service people came. So I really do appreciate, and I'm looking forward to your feedback. Your feedback will be very valuable to me, and I'm hopefully you can follow up with you as we go along. So after some 48 years in the fire service, this is the conclusion I've come to. No great thing, but that's where I've come. That when a civilian dies in a fire, it's not an act of God. Now you say, Clark, why, why would you say that? Well, if you listen to people when they talk about somebody dying in a fire, if it's not arson, and if they can't blame anybody else, we turn to God to help explain why this terrible thing happened. So this isn't just in this country, this is kind of around the world. So we're still blaming God when something happens as opposed to looking at our own responsibility. That's a pretty big shift. Now, the other one is about firefighters dying. When I first came in the job, my lieutenant said to me, firefighters have to get killed as part of the job. That single concept just irritated me. But when that happens, they probably taught you in working school, you are not allowed to break bad on your lieutenant, right? But I was very angry at that. And I remembered that, and I knew it was wrong, but at the time, I didn't understand why or where it was coming from. But as time goes by, I understand where the lieutenant was coming from and why he would think that. But a lot of our brothers and sisters still think that when firefighters are killed and injured, it's part of the job. And I'll try to show us where that concept came from. When, when the public sees fire, they usually see things like this. If you remember the ghost ship fire that happened in California, 33 people died. It made headline news. Headline news. A lot more were in there, but 33 people died. Or over 15 years ago, the station nightclub fire in Rhode Island, where 100 people died. So that gets people's attention. It makes the nightly news. So when people see that, they think fire is something that happens to someone else. It doesn't happen in our town. It happens someplace else. Even when firefighters get killed, we usually don't get killed in large numbers like this. We usually die in ones and twos. But you're familiar with the super sofa store fire where nine of us died. Or the uh, Granite Mountain fire where 19 firefighters died. That makes national news. But that's not how things happen. Things happen in ones and twos. Or they, sometimes they don't happen until well after you retired because you've caught some kind of disease or cancer or something as a result of occupational exposure. So that's what gets the attention, but those aren't the real big issues. Look at the California fire. Everybody's talking about the California brush fires. It's cost over $180 billion. $180 billion. That was last year, and I think this year is going to be even worse than last year. Now, is this limited to California? No. What happened in Tennessee? Tennessee had a big brush fire. Killed people. Lost lots of property. That's not supposed to happen. Global warming is real, and it's going to affect the fire service. 
it's going to affect you, especially you guys, before you retire, you will have major brush fires that you have to respond to that are way out of your norm. They may any, even end up giving you brush fire gear because you've got lots of forests around here and things are drying out. Global warming is real. You are going to have to deal with that. This is how fires really happen. Since January 1st of this year until today, 1,435 people have died in home fires. No one knows that. You probably didn't even know that. That's the fire problem. 1,435 people died in their own homes. I think that's a problem. And you can see where it's happening by state. Can you find North Carolina in there? You're in the top half. You're in the top half. So if you think you don't have a fire problem, I think you do. The elected officials probably don't think you have a fire problem because it doesn't happen every day. They don't see it. It's not in front of them. When I picked up the USA Today and looked at it, there was not one word about fire from the front page to the back page. There were no stories about fire any place in the USA Today. So if it's not in USA Today, obviously it's not an issue, is it? That's part of the problem. We, we don't put the issue in front of the public enough until some kind of tragedy happens, and then we all feel so bad about it, we don't realize that we are part of the problem that created that problem. So if we're part of the problem, we have to be part of the solution. Whenever I do public presentations, I always try to dedicate it or memorialize it to somebody. Because I don't ride on fire trucks anymore. But things happen, I'm not there, but they still affect me. You lost five children in North Carolina back in May. There were no working smoke alarms in that apartment. There were immigrants from the Dominican, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. How big a tragedy is that? I think it's a big tragedy. You all, we also lost a brother firefighter. July 4th, responding to an auto accident. He didn't have a seatbelt on. Did you, were you ever in a fire truck without your seatbelt on? You don't have to respond. But you know in the heart of your hearts how good you are at wearing your seatbelt when the fire truck moves or your personal vehicle. So the solutions to the problem are not difficult. We know the solutions to the problem. Are we willing to actually do it? That's a personal decision everyone has to make almost every day. Not someday in the future. Every day you have to make decisions. If you haven't read America Burning, I don't know if it's part of your curriculum as a rookie or not, or the elected officials, this is a while ago, but you need to be familiar with America Burning. That was in 1973 when uh, Richard Nixon was actually the president. Uh, the commission had been in involved for a while. It took about three years. They came out with that event, and they said, fire in America is a problem. It's both an economic, technological, political, and social problem. All these elements of society play a role in the fire problem and the fire solution. Part of the challenge is, a lot of people see fire protection or fire safety as little red fire plastic fire hats, Smokey the Bear, a fire dog, and a talking fire plug. That's okay, but that's not where the real issue is. The real issue is in the White House, Capitol Hill, your, wherever your governor lives, your state legislature, your mayor's office, your elected officials, the business community, the Fortune 500, the problem is in the boardrooms because they create the situation that we have to respond to. And if we don't start telling the truth that we cannot fix the problems that you create for us, they're going to keep creating the same problems 
over and over and over again, and we're going to be reacting to them as opposed to being proactive ahead of time. When this first came out, I was a young firefighter. I think I was, I was 23 at the time. That picture was in this book. That picture so influenced me that I wrote away and got him to give me an actual copy of it, and I had that in my office my whole career because that signified the problem that exists, and it still exists today. And if you ever respond to that, you will never forget that. All your training, all your equipment, all your bravado, all the bench presses that you do can't solve that problem. That's a hard pill to... He said I was going to say stuff that you didn't like, didn't he? He was... That's the safety zone. <laughs> he was preparing you. That's not going to solve that problem. That problem needs to be solved before you get the alarm. Before you get the alarm. So, as my, as my uh, time in the fire service progressed, back in 2004... The National Fallen Firefighters Foundation had a summit down in um, Florida, and they came up with the 16 Firefighter Life Safety Initiatives, if you remember that. The first initiative was about looking at the American fire culture. I happened to be the facilitator for that group. So I was the one herding all these cats to come up with that simple statement that the fire culture is the problem, and if we don't get fix the fire culture, we're not going to fix anything. So that's when I went on my odyssey to find out what do we mean by the word culture? We all think we know what it means, but do we really? And then, because you have to understand the meaning of something before you can use it to help you fix things. So going to the literature, I found Edgar Schein at MIT. He was kind of the guru, if you will, of organizational culture, defining it, explaining it, making it so I could understand it and the rest of the working world really could understand it if they used his model. So this is the model that I've applied to trying to figure out why we have the present fire culture we have. How did we get to where we are today? So it's the past, the present, and then some looking into our crystal ball, what do we have to do to fix it in the future? Because if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're still going to get the same outcome on the other end. So we have to have some kind of roadmap. So this gives us that roadmap to look at culture at the biggest, broadest level down to the individual personal level. Because that's really what culture is. Culture is how I behave and why I behave and where did it come from? Fireman language, the whole book, it's out of the 300 pages, boils down to why we do what we do. And can we really answer the question, why, honestly? So Shine gives us an answer to that, and he tells us how to figure it out. He says that, and this makes sense. He says, any time a group of people get together, their purpose for being is about external adaptation. In other words, they get together so they can fix something that's happening to them, and then they also want to be able to survive. So human beings have done that since we crawled out of the, even when we were in the caves. We had to get together collectively, talk about tribes. It's about the culture so we could survive. And you have to make some kind of deal between you and the external world so you can survive, feed your family, ward off enemies, all kinds of things. But without knowing what they were doing, they did these kind of things. They had strategies, they had goals, they had means, they had measures, they corrected stuff to make sure of their survival and their ability to work with that external environment. That's the external look. So external to the fire service is everybody that's not in the fire service. So we make a deal with them and they make a deal with us and that's how we got to where we are today. Internally, how do we function as a fire service? We all have rules and regulations that explain all of these things. They explain all of these things. Right? You've, you've started to learn and memorize all the rules and regulations that help you understand those kinds of things. Each one of those rules and regulations 
was probably created because somebody got away with something they weren't supposed to, or somebody did something they weren't supposed to, or somebody got hurt and wasn't supposed to, or a new piece of equipment became better. So we've evolved over time. But it still goes back to, why are we doing that? For example, everybody understands this. Punishment, right? Discipline. What's one of the worst things a firefighter can do? Be late for work. Yes? They will ostracize you if you are late for work. You will be labeled a no good firefighter if you are late for work. The union, you can't, you have a union, do you have unions? The union will not back you up if you're late for work. That's one of the worst things that you can do. If you're late enough, they will fire you. Yes? No doubt about it. How many times do you not wear your seatbelt before they fire you? Maybe they never fire if you don't wear your seatbelt because nobody's going to tell on you if nobody wears your seatbelt. So why is being late for work such a punishment, but a safety rule, eh, it's a rule, but you know, we really don't want to follow it. How many rules are that way? Now, when I first came on a job, there were no women on the job. None. Women could not be firefighters. Women came on the job. Also today, if you inappropriately touch another firefighter, you will be fired probably on a first offense. So being late for work is no good. We made that one up. Who made up the one about inappropriately touching firefighters? Society. Society says we are not allowed to inappropriately touch each other, no matter who you are. And we know the punishment for that. You will be fired if you inappropriately touch somebody. But how many times do you let somebody not wear a seatbelt? So we pick and choose the rules and regulations that we follow and the ones we don't follow. And again, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm trying to get us to look at ourselves and our behavior and to be honest about it. Because sometimes we don't even know why we do what we do. We've just always done it that way. So in my research, I go back to Ben Franklin. So I'm, we can blame all of our problems on Ben Franklin. It's nice to have a scapegoat. So, and, but it wasn't even Ben's fault. Ben was functioning in the environment he had to work in. But we just carried on some of his traditions that maybe we shouldn't. Because Schein says that the, the, any culture is based on its artifacts, its espoused beliefs, and the hard part is its underlying assumptions. He refers to this as the DNA of an organization. The artifacts are the easy stuff. That's the hardware, the things we can see, the things we can touch, the rules and regulations, the policies and procedures, your budget, all that stuff are the artifacts. The next level are the espoused beliefs. Those are our justifications or motivation why we are do why are we doing this? That's the stuff we tell each other, our, our motivation. But he says the hard part is the underlying assumptions, those unconscious, taken for granted beliefs, perceptions, thoughts, and feelings, ultimately the source of our values and actions. Now, why does he use that phrase DNA? Because it's passed down generation after generation. I'm six feet, four inches tall. I'm usually tall, except when I'm around your chief. He's the only chief I can see eye to eye to. <laughs> I think he's a little taller than I am. Aren't you six five? At a half. <laughs> six five and a half. I'm only six four, and I'm shrinking. Anyway, now, I'm a ge genetic mutation because I have six lumbar vertebrae. How am I supposed to have? Five, right? I'm only supposed to have five. I got six. That's one reason I'm so tall. Now, I didn't know it, but it's there, birth defect, and there's no disc, there's no cartilage between L5 and L6. So they tell me eventually I'll have to have those fused.
but luckily so far, knock on wood or plastic, you know, I haven't had to have that done yet. And I've never really had back problems, but that's part of my DNA that I had nothing to do with. It's just passed down generation to generation. Organizations can have the same kind of thing. So we're going to look at this. DNA is made up of genes, individual pieces of the DNA put together in certain, sequ certain, cer certain sequences determine the, how the organism behaves or what it looks like and how it functions, right? So what are, what do you, what does the fire service, what is American fire culture, what's the basic DNA makeup of the American fire culture? So to answer this, I went back to Ben Franklin. That's a good place to start. And I looked at Ben Franklin and his fire service and his firefighters and the culture that they worked in. And I kept peeling the onion back to narrow it down to the essence of what I thought it was. And I came up with these, three, these six genes. These six genes are what make up American fire protection. From Ben Franklin to today, and we're going to go through each one of them. Fast, close, wet, risk, injury, and death. Fast, close, wet, risk, injury, and death. Now, all of this, this whole premise, is based on the fact that a large part of what we do today is still a manual fire protection model. Meaning that when a fire starts in a community, a bunch of people have to get on something and go to where the fire is and then manually put it out. Now, that's fundamentally different than an automatic fire protection culture. This building is an automatic fire protection culture. Why? Because it has a sprinkler head in it. That's the primary fire protection for this building is that sprinkler head. Now, some firefighters are going to show up, but that's secondary, not primary. Now, society has known for a long time that manual fire protection is not very efficient and effective. The ones that know it the best were the commercial side of society. Sprinklers, automatic sprinklers have been around for a long time. And in the early 1800s, uh, late 1800s, the, the manufacturing industry, especially in, in, in uh, New England, they realized their warehouses, their buildings were burning down because they couldn't fight the fire manually. They had to put in automatic fire protection. That's the only way to really stop the fire. But that, that was, their motivation was monetary because they would lose all their stock. They would lose everything. But when it came to the rest of us, well, it was too expensive. We couldn't afford it. It wasn't that bad. Not that many people died. So that fell by the wayside. So that, that whole manual fire protection model, is we're still stuck with it. We don't see automatic fire protection as our primary way of fire protection. Most of the time it works. I'm not saying that the fire service is bad. We do a great job. But when something goes wrong, it's because one of these things came outside of the parameter and that's what causes the problem. So if we want to fix the problem, we have to really tell the truth about these particular DNA genes. Let's look at each one from historically to where we are now. If you were in Ben Franklin days, literally, you, only young guys were firefighters because they literally had to run, physically run, run to the fire, carrying buckets of water. It was a manual fire protection, firefighting bucket brigade kind of thing, right? So you had to be fast. This, this is actually a, a hose cart. It's got a bell on it and different colored lights. So when you pull it, it goes ding, 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 and the lights flash to let people know, hey, the fire department's coming. Get out of the way. We have to be fast to get you to solve the problem. Do we still have lights and things that make noise on fire trucks? Sure, because we think we have to be fast. This is a, a hand, not so, it's got a bell on it, right? <clears throat> These had uh, T-bars that would come down with a handle across it. These carts were actually pulled initially on a rope. So you'd have 15, 20 firefighters pulling this rope with the cart as fast as they could. But two guys were on the T-handle here. 
Those two guys were the brakemen. Because what happened if one of the guys on the rope slipped and fell down? You can't, with that, the guys on the rope can't stop that car, can they? He's going to run over and hurt. The two guys, the brakemen, they actually had a, a, an SOP or a training thing where they would turn real quick to turn the wheels and stop the cart. Right? They were pretty smart guys because they realized being fast was okay, but if you slip on a cobblestone street, it can be dangerous. So let's look at fast today. How do we translate this into fast today? The fire occurs. Four people die in a house fire. And a news headline talks about that the fire department responded within four minutes and 41 seconds. So the fire department did a great job because they got there really quick. They got there within their allotted response time. But the problem was the people were dead and the house was fully involved. What part of the equation did they miss? There were no working smoke alarms in the house. So how fast the fire truck got there, that was the least important part of the equation. Because if we don't know there's a fire, we can't do anything about it. That's a hard thing for us to admit because we put so much effort in this response time thing. This is the New York City Fire Department, the largest, best fire department in the world, according to them. All right? Seven kids died in this house fire. Seven kids died in a house fire. The fire department was there in 3.5 minutes, but they were all dead. There was only one working smoke detector in the house, and it was in the basement. But the, so the, 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 time resp the time question shouldn't be how fast did the fire department get here? The time question should be when was the last time the fire department knocked on these people's door to see if they had a working smoke detector? Does that change the dynamic? I think it does, big time. Don't get all puffed up about your got there in 3.5 3 minutes. That doesn't prove anything to me. That doesn't prove to me how, what a great fire department you are. When was the last time you stopped by this house to see if it had working smoke detectors? That tells you a lot about how good that fire department is, in my judgment. This is Baltimore. This is Congressman Elijah's coming staff person. This is not an inner city. This is not a low-income family. Six kids died in this house fire. No working smoke alarm. Elijah Cummings, senior staff person. A smart family. How, 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 how is that possible? How, how did we allow that to happen? Well, to, to, this is not political. Today, before I came, they're doing some kind of kabuki dance on Capitol Hill. They're, apparently, they're uh, questioning some FBI agent about him texting about Trump and all that kind of stuff. That thing is going. I could not believe all these congressmen up there, the kabuki dance they were doing. It was, it was unbelievable to watch about yelling at each other and motions, and it was uh, undecipherable. And I was wondering, I wonder how many of them got working smoke detectors in their homes. I wonder how many of their kids have working smoke detectors in their homes. I wonder if their grandkids have smoke detectors in their homes. But they probably weren't thinking about that, were they? They were all fighting over this political kind of thing, thinking, wow. If only. If only. So the conclusion I've come to, and again, the chief's not going to like this, response time is the white elephant of the fire service. From Ben Franklin to today, we have hung our hat on this response time thing. 
as if that makes the majority difference in the outcome. It doesn't. And that's a hard thing for us to swallow. And it's a hard thing for us to admit. Right? Now, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with this white, uh, uh, white elephant concept, it's a fable out of Siam where the king would give to somebody in the county that he particularly hated, the king would give them a white elephant. And the white elephant was revered as something special, but it couldn't do any work. It was not allowed to do any work, but you still had to feed it and water it and take care of it, and it would bankrupt the county when they got this, but nobody could complain because it was a gift from the king, but it was designed to really destroy. So that I, that's why I use that analogy that, you know, and again, I'm not saying take away his response time, Mr. Councilman, but the point is, it's an issue that we have to deal with. Right? We have to be able to deal with that. Uh, this was Baltimore also. This ladder truck went through a stop, went through a red light. It was the third due on smoke in a hallway. It hit this car. It hit the car. How fast was it going to say? Uh, yeah, it was going 47 miles an hour. Hit this car, killed the three people in the car. The three people were from different families. Okay? But the, the law in that state exempts firefighters and police officers from gross negligence. So the tort liability was capped at $40,000 for this entire incident. So three families had to split $40,000. So the law gave us permission to kill somebody. Because society thinks firefighters need to be fast. So fast that they can break the law and put people at risk. So we're just responding to what society has created for us. They've created this mindset that fast trumps everything. This particular case happened in uh, Connecticut, this pumper blew the red light, hit the ladder truck. The driver and the officer of the pumper were thrown out the front windshield. The officer died. The wife sued. It went all the way to the Supreme Court of that state, and the Supreme Court said, she was not eligible to sue, to sue because her husband, if he had survived, would have, been avail would have been eligible for workman's comp. So again, the law protected us, giving us permission to hurt each other and not hold anybody accountable. These aren't bad people that make this law. It's just that the, their culture and our society, we think we need to behave this way. Do we really? What are we trying to accomplish? DC, just last year, engine went through a blue red light, hit a car, killed the driver of the car. DC had uh, camera systems, but the camera system on that ladder truck uh, and pumper had not been working for several months and hadn't been fixed. So obviously that wasn't that important. Let's look at close for a minute. Like I said, if you're Ben Franklin's firefighters, you got to throw buckets of water on the fire. So literally, the, uh, the lad with the most testosterone and can get closest, doesn't mind getting singed now and then, he gets all the accolades. He gets the awards because everybody thinks he's a great guy. Look how... So they're throwing buckets of water. This is actually a photograph of the first combination SCBA thermal imaging camera. Now, it's not like the ones you use, but if you read the advertisement for this, the advertisement says, lets you see through smoke, lets you breathe in smoke. So we have been trying to get closer to the fire since day one, because we know the closer you get, you can put the water on it. So that construct of getting close to the fire, we've been stuck with that idea for a long time. And we keep trying to refine this. 
How close to that fire do these guys have to get? How far does a stream of water squirt? It's close, farther than that, right? Farther than that. But we see this picture as this is what we see as what firefighters are supposed to do. I can't tell if this guy's hat's on fire or what, but how close do we have to get to the fire? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to prove? So our technological decision to fix it, I don't know if you've gone to the new plastic on your face pieces. Have you gone to the new plastic? The, the new plastic melts at 1,000 degrees. The old plastic melted at 536 degrees. Why, are we, why do we need to get that close to the fire? If, we're, if we need to have 1,000 degrees, something is wrong. We're not meant to be in 1,000 degree temperatures. But we think that's the solution to the fire is an engineering fix. No, no. There was a, they used to do, when I was, now nah, they don't do anything, but they used to do, tabletop exercises were literally that. They had a, like a kid's toys and buildings and smoke and stuff. And a guy was doing a tabletop exercise and the building was getting more and more fire. So they kept sending more firefighters in the building. Finally, the instructor picked up one of the fire trucks and put it in the building. And everybody said, no, no, no put, don't put the fire truck in there. The fire truck's too expensive. They teach us not to park the fire truck too close, right? Because it could bubble the paint. Yet we'll send people into the burning building. Does anybody beside me see this as a, something not... The Ben Franklin knew, and in those kind of days, most all the big cities had conflagrations. And really, the only way to stop conflagration is with large quantities of water. So the connection of water being able to be distributed throughout cities and fire, Trey, was the chief was telling me that you still have or had some wooden water mains in the area. And that, um, uh, did you say George Washington came to visited looking at the water systems or something? Yeah. Looking at the water systems because that's what was needed to be able to protect communities. They needed to have water systems that they could pump water to be able to fight the fire so the whole town wouldn't burn down. But when we think water supply, we think this as opposed to this. If you have 24... 36 inch mains are running through town, it's so you can have large capacity of flowing lots of water. If all the buildings in town were sprinkler from day one, you don't need that big capacity because what happens? The fire doesn't happen to begin with. But that's that's a, that's a culture shift that's changing the paradigm. This was a uh, 15,000 square foot home. It was obviously a, a, million, a millionaire's home. When he built it, it had complete um, smoke alarm systems in it, but it was under the time frame for the residential sprinkler ordinance in Maryland. It had beat that time frame. So what didn't have sprinklers in it? It was a monitored system. In other words, when the alarm went off, it went to the uh, alarm company, who then called the fire department. When the fire department got there, fire was coming out all the doors and windows. Six people died in that fire, two grandparents and four grandkids. The Christmas tree in the atrium of the living room was like, it was February when the fire happened. So the Christmas tree had been around a long time. It had hundreds of thousands of lights on it. And they think the Christmas tree caught fire and the kids ran and hid with grandma. Grandpa came downstairs, tried to fight the fire and they didn't get out. So I'm sure that that, the person certainly could have afforded to put residential sprinklers in the house. He could have. But for some reason, he decided he didn't need them. This, this building actually burned twice in New Jersey. The fire, the people were, uh, the, the lower half was sprinklered, but the attic space wasn't sprinklered. And it was actually them working, cutting some stuff in the attics that the, uh, Attic caught fire and just overwhelmed the sprinkler system. 
Harris, uh, Pennsylvania had passed a residential sprinkler ordinance for its new construction. They passed it. A new governor and a new state legislature came in and they overrode it. They had it and then they overrode it. Let me say that again. They had it, then they overrode it. Now, in the meantime, what they gave the fire service was a presumptive heart and lung bill. That if you get, get cancer or heart disease, they'll pay your family if you don't survive, or they'll pay for your insurance. So they, they didn't fight for the sprinkler law. They gave that up, but they got a heart and lung bill. I haven't updated this. Is, uh, is uh, North, South, North Carolina, are you guys still green? In other words, is your res have you changed your residential sprinkler ordinances? It's still the same? Which means that, in, if I understand right, the green is, at the state level, there's a law that says you cannot have a mandatory residential sprinkler ordinance, and at the local level, you cannot have a mandatory residential sprinkler ordinance. Look how many states are in that category. I think there's 18 plus the, the, the other ones. It's state prohibited, but you can't have it locally. Altogether, there's 34 states that say you can't have statewide mandatory residential sprinkler laws. Only two states have it. Maryland and California. South Carolina had it, but they lost it. They, I don't think they got it back, did they? I don't think so. But, but here's the question. And again, this is going to make people uncomfortable when I ask this question. Legislatively, what are we fighting for now as a fire service discipline? What? Jobs and cancer, benefits. cancer benefits. Cancer benefits is the big thing, right? And at the federal level, we just passed the cancer registry. Uh, President Trump just passed the cancer registry. So now firefighters say so they can start doing better research about our cancer. So my argument is, why can't the fire service have two number ones? One for us and one for them. If we talk about how them is more important than us, how come we're not fighting as hard for residential sprinkler ordinances as we are for cancer stuff? You can have two number ones. That's a decision that we make. There are, it, it, so people do respond when there's situations happen. If you're familiar with the fire that took place in London, right, that's still being investigated. Fascinating case. If you're not following that case, I, especially now that you don't have to study anymore, right, start looking at that case. Fascinating how they are interviewing and taking deposition, or I wouldn't call it interviewing. The, the fire people there have to testify in terms of what they do in, in court kind of stuff. It's fascinating to listen to. But anyway, so when this happened, Florida had passed a mandatory retrofit ordinance for apartment complexes, particularly where a lot of old people live. It was supposed to go into effect in 2020. Well, the, the legislature was, had, had come up with a bill to reverse it, to not make it mandatory, to just make it if you wanted to do it. So it wouldn't be mandatory after having been there for so long, but they were fighting it. So, and the legislature passed it. Now, the governor over or vetoed that piece of legislation after this fire took place. So kudos to the governor because he understood sprinklers are the only thing that can stop this kind of stuff from happening. Man, manual fire protection will not save us from this. It has to be built-in automatic fire protection. So the governor in Florida, he took the political heat, and he said, I'm going to override this. And it was his own party, too. So kudos to him. Let's look at risk. The risk of firefighting will never go away. 
because you are, you are trying to solve a problem that, in other words, you didn't start the problem, but you are there to fix it. There's a lot of stuff about that you don't know about. Uh, a friend of mine told, had, was in the military, and he was talking to some Navy SEALs, explaining what firefighters do, that will be asleep, the bells will go off, within four to five minutes, we will engage the enemy, meaning the fire, in a building we probably haven't been in in a long time, we haven't drilled in that particular building, we don't know exactly what we're going to use when we get there. And the Navy SEAL said, we would never do that. We would never do that. We have maps, we have drawings, we've practiced the event long before it's happened. That's why they're so good at what they do. Because they don't play like we play. That's the risk that we create. They do away with the risk. We run toward that risk, sometimes without even knowing what we're running towards. So the risk is always there. So we come up with slogans. The biggest slogan now, you'll see this on lots of material, risk a lot, risk a little, risk nothing. But the problem with that phrasing is everybody has a different, different, a different definition of risk, much less lot, little, and nothing. Look at the photograph. There's, he's got, what, $10,000 worth of gear? And for some reason, he's trying to save 20 cents worth of compressed air. So the question is, how many times before has he done this Where's his officer? Does anybody else on the fire ground see this? If you saw it, what would you do? I think it's more complicated than that. See, this doesn't help. This does not help. This is the last NIOSH report I did the evaluation on. 19-year-old volunteer. This was the house that was on fire. He arrived in a pickup truck. Uh, his company was there, but all the SCBAs were off of that apparatus. So he took an SCBA off another company's apparatus that he never used before. And then he and an officer they go in the front door, they can't find anything, they come back out, they go in the basement door, he gets separated, ends up dead. The only life hazard in the house were the firefighters. How many things, how many risks were taken that ultimately ended up in that outcome? That's what you're going to have to face when you get on a fire truck every day. Every day. This uh, pumper was going on an EMS call. The driver lost control. It hit a tree. The officer was ejected out the front windshield. Obviously, he didn't have a seatbelt on. A couple other guys were hurt in the apparatus, too. Then they investigated and they found out that the seat belt alarm and that apparatus had been disconnected because the guys complained it was too noisy. That wasn't the worst of it. When they inspected the rest of the fleet, what's it say? It says 15. Actually, it turned out to be 19 pieces of apparatus had the seat belt alarms disconnected, taped over, or made non-functional in that fire department. This is a major metropolitan fire department. 19 pieces of apparatus had the seatbelt alarms purposefully disconnected. How many people had to know that? 
how high a rank did people have to know that that condition existed? and did nothing about it, didn't fix it. This was uh, when the Denver Broncos won the national football title. They thought how cool it would be to drive around the city with the football players on top of fire trucks. There were like half a dozen different fire departments supplied apparatus to do this. And to my knowledge, only one person had the tenacity to say that's wrong and write letters to the National Football League the, uh, the, inter the NFPA, the U.S. Fire Administration, the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, and the International Association of Fire Chiefs, saying, don't do this, it's wrong. NFPA wrote back to this person and said, well, you know, our standards are only consensus standards, and they can be accepted or rejected as they choose. The U.S. Fire Administration didn't write back. The Fallen Firefighters Foundation said, yes, uh, but we can't make anybody do anything. But if they want to give us a, 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 a donation, we'll be glad to put together a program for them. The uh, National Football League said, we're going to turn it over to our security department. Haven't heard back from security yet. But I haven't seen a national football team on top of a fire truck since. So maybe it did make a difference. I don't know. This, this is this is the owner, I think, and that's the that's the um, that's the quarterback's little daughter up there on a fire truck. Where is it? One of them is drinking champagne. It was a big event. But that leads to this. This, when people do this, the risk is invisible to them because they're on a fire truck. Nothing bad can happen you on a fire truck. Do we all have to go? Or just Gage and DeSoto. That sounds like a Gage and DeSoto engine 51, squad 51 tone. <clears throat> you guys are too old, too young to know what that means, right? This is invisible to them. But how many times is this stuff still going on? Um, talk about, just think about this construct of risk for a minute. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a decision made I don't, within my career that firefighters dying at a hazmat incident was not heroic. Whether it was a conscious or unconscious decision, that decision was made. Every fire department today handles a potential hazmat incident differently than a house fire. If you roll up on something that looks green and smoky and in some kind of tank, usually back off, you know, deny access, put the tape up, and call the hazmat team. But what's more hazardous than a house fire in terms of what's burning in there? But we just, we just have a different mindset, a different way of thinking about it. I was given this presentation down in uh, Mississippi, and the new fire chief in a big city down there said, yeah, Bert, he said, I used to be in charge of hazmat. So that's what, that was my whole background. I came up with hazmat. So he said, when I got to be fire chief, I kept getting these injury reports about people on a fire ground, burns around the wrists, burns around the ears. And we investigated, guys just weren't putting all their stuff on. So we said, I can change this problem. So they changed the policy. 
The first arriving unit at a house fire puts the red tape up around the house before anybody goes in. And they do checkpoints in and out, just like they do on a hazmat incident. You don't have all your gear on, you can't go in the hot zone. What a radical idea. They hated him. But guess what? No more injuries at house fires. So depending upon what we say and what we really think, we can make a difference. Don't, don't run me out of town just because maybe we should treat building fires like hazmat incidents. Injury. Um, in this little house, it was like only like 800 square feet or something like that. Seven guys got hurt, I think. It was a vacant house, locked up, boarded up, and yet seven firefighters got hurt in that house. And so the, 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 the congressional person from that district, she decided she wanted to give these injured firefighters an award. The fire chief tried to, not, to, tried to stop it. And he, he had to put it off for several months. But finally, she got up and they gave them this congressional award about because firefighters put their own lives at risk. Unfortunately, seven of them got hurt. They are heroes. They make the ultimate contribution, personal sacrifice. So the elected officials is trying to like saying, this is what they expect us to do. They expect us to get hurt and killed. And they think that's heroic. No, you injure seven guys, something went wrong. Seven guys are not supposed to get hurt. That's a shift, that's a cultural shift. The same thing to manufacturers that gave the gear to this, this is the DC Fire Department. The, the back half of this house was fully involved. It was a vacant house. So now all of these circles are all the people in this house because they think they gotta get close. Nobody else was in there but them. And then it flashed over to the house, the top that fell on them. So several of them got hurt. So now the gear manufacturers decide, wow, we're gonna, you know, our gear helped save these guys. What a great gear we have. So we're gonna give them an award. Oops. So they gave them an award on the steps of the Capitol building and they called their heroic efforts, a calling that puts them in harm's way. They put it on the line all the time, celebrating this error. as opposed to seeing it as an occupational injury where something went wrong. This is the toughest one to talk about because when somebody gets killed doing this job, we make heroes out of them. And then we go right back out and do the same thing over again. If you read the NIOSH reports, you'll see what I'm talking about. And it, it, go, it goes way back before Ben Franklin, but uh, this quote from Croker in 1908, a lot of times this is referred to, firemen are going to get killed. When they join the department, they face that fact. When a man becomes a fireman, his greatest act of bravery has been accomplished. What he does after that is all in the line of work. They were not thinking about getting killed when they went where fire lurked. They went there to put the fire out and got killed. Firemen do not regard themselves as heroes because they do what the business requires. Do we still believe that getting killed and injured is part of the job? I have yet to see a job description that says you could die being a firefighter. Does, anybody, does any of your job descriptions say that? but yet we hang our hat on that construct. This was probably one of the most controversial articles I ever wrote. Uh, the, our, our ceremonialization of firefighter fatalities, I think, is left over from the Civil War. Uh, after the Civil War, there were a lot of Americans that had been taught in military discipline. So in the military, when there's casualty, they have the big ceremonialization of the casualty. Napoleon said, give with enough ribbon, I can conquer the world. 
With enough ribbon, I can conquer the world. Why? Because Napoleon made the serfs' death on a battleground as important to society as a king dying. So they would honor them and give them that honor to get more people willing to do that kind of work. So during the Civil War, a lot of people got killed, and they had the ceremonialization of military with the pomp and circumstance. When, after the Civil War, the first career fire departments were started, and a lot of those same military ceremonial activity was carried over into the civilian world. And we kept repeating that ceremonialization. Now, I, for one, think that when we compare a firefighter fatality to a soldier's fatality, we are insulting the soldier. I was never in the military. But firefighters are not soldiers. There is no enemy trying to kill us. It's a chemistry and physics problem. It's not a social and moral problem that war is. It's a different paradigm. That's why this was so controversial when I wrote this. But this is, let me show you the difference. A we should do away with the term line of duty death. We should call them what they are, occupational fatalities. Occupational fatalities are not supposed to happen. Occupational injuries are not supposed to happen. In that domain, when there is an occupational injury or occupational fatality, the employer is always 51% responsible. Why? Because as your employer, I control your behavior. And if I fail to control your behavior and you do something wrong, that's mostly on me because I did not hold you accountable. It's a different mindset, but we're not there yet because we still memorialize our errors and we blame the firefighter as opposed to blaming the organization for not controlling the firefighter. We can control your behavior. Don't be late for work. We'll fire you. We understand how to control behavior, don't we? It's whether we choose to do it or not. That's the hard part. When the BP oil rig took, exploded, 11 oil rig workers were killed. BP was fined over $4 billion by society for the 11 oil rig workers that died, plus the environmental disaster that took place. Compare that to the Charleston Nine, where the nine guys died in the Charleston Super Sofa Store fire. The fine for the nine guys at Charleston Super Service Store Fire from the state was $3,160 to the city. Now, why are oil rig workers' lives worth more than firefighters' lives? I don't think they are. But what's worse, if you actually got a copy of the citation that they've had to pay, I wrote to the South Carolina Got a copy of it. I'm paraphrasing. This is what it reads. There were three citations in that fine for the $3,160. One. And they may not be in order, but one. Three or more firefighters on the fire ground that did not have all of their PPE on, excluding the nine dead firefighters. Number two. Three or more firefighters on the fire ground that did not have their SCBA on, excluding the nine dead firefighters. And the last one, the fire department should have known that their ICS system was only activated at hazmat incidents. Those three citations are what the $3,160 fine was for which means how much was the fine for the nine dead firefighters? Zero.
Now, you can't put a value on people's lives. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the argument's about. It's about how does society, and I'm not blaming South Carolina. I'm not blaming the Department of Labor. That's what we think. We think when firefighters get killed, that's supposed to happen. But when oil workers get killed, that's not supposed to happen. That's a fundamental cultural problem. At the highest level, East Coast, West Coast, volunteer career doesn't matter. Until we break that paradigm, are we really just kidding ourselves? The Yarnell Fire, where the 19 firefighters died, right? The Yarnell Fire. This was the report and the investigation that the fire service did. This was the report that the Department of Labor did. Same fire. The fire department said, we didn't do anything wrong. They followed the guidelines. Everything was correct. Oh, well. That was the firefighter's conclusion. The fire service's conclusion was, nothing went wrong. We did everything right. How do you kill 19 guys and everything went right? I don't know. Again, I'm not blaming the investigators. That's the culture that they come from. That's what we put into their brain from the time. Ben, if you want to blame somebody, blame Ben Franklin. But we have to break that paradigm. We have to change that gene that getting killed is not part of the job. Now, in this case, the occupational safety people, they did a much better job. They came up and said, yes, there were errors. They didn't do things the right way. Did they use the word negligence? Failed to prioritize. Uh, I don't think they used it. It goes far as saying they, they were negligent, but they didn't follow their own protocols. They didn't follow their own protocols. So they started calling the, the real facts out of the case. So we did get some protection out of this. I think, I think the, the, the fine was not much. I think most of the people got about $50,000. So, if you want to change something, change like as the only absolute, but what changes does the fire service lead? What are we doing to fix the problem? Are we telling the truth? To change something, Shine also tells us how to do this. You have to unfreeze the present behavior, say, you have to start questioning and say, you know, this is not working, I'm not getting the, the, the result I want. You have to go through this cognitive restructuring. You have to be able to say, yes, I can do better. At the individual level, at the company level, at the organizational level, at the community level, at the elected level, all those people, we can do better. Because we know how to do it. It's just that we decide to do it. Then we have to refreeze and do the new thing. Do the new behavior. And encourage other. And that becomes the success by doing the new behavior. Let's look at this case study. If you're familiar with the uh, Fresno, California fire, this is where the captain fell through the roof. Everybody remember where the captain fell through the roof? Well, let's see if we can make the video work. Uh, I, just as a, a warning, there is a expletive deleted in here, but it's not deleted. So b be ready for a, a bystander saying a bad word if it works.
He survived. He survived. He survived. Uh, and again, I, I'm not taking anything away from that fire department, good fire department. The chief is an EFO graduate. Um, it was certainly a shock to her when this happened. The, the officer, the captain, was considered the best captain on the job. He had one of those reputations. He was at training. Everybody looked up to him. He was like the best of the best, right? Best of the best. Had done the same thing a, a hundred times before. Nothing bad happened. But when they investigated, this, 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 is, this is what they found when they investigated. Causal factors about leadership and safety culture. Number one, the captain and few people actually ever wore their Nomex hoods. The captain's Nomex hood was in the top of the crown of his hat. His chin strap wasn't down. He didn't have his gloves on. They were still in the roll-up, you know, fastened on the front of his coat. His radio was, uh, it was either turned off or on the wrong channel, so he couldn't use his radio. And typically, firefighters didn't wear their seatbelt going to calls. So here the, here's the challenge, you know. If we can't get the little stuff right, what makes us think we're going to get the big stuff right? And nobody is making us do these things except ourselves, except that Ben Franklin DNA, fast, close, wet, risk, injury, and death. It'll bite you in the butt every time if you let it. Because if you're given a choice between following your rules and regulations and your innate DNA, especially if everybody else around you is not doing it the right way, guess what way you're going to do it? You're going to do the way everybody else is doing it. That was, the captain was the best guy on the job. That became the norm because nobody had ever gotten hurt. So why do we have to follow the rules and regulations? Now, but when something happens, you've got to decide what you're going to do about it. So luckily, you can't read this part, but basically the, the, the fire chief and the union president, I can't focus enough, to, the union president put out a joint memo under their name. And basically it said, from now on, we're going to do these things. We're going to all wear our PPE no matter what. We're going to all put our damn seatbelt on and we're all going to use the radio. <laughs> I mean, but you actually have to do it. You actually have to do it 100% right 100% of the time. That's what makes somebody a professional. When they follow the rules and regulations 100% right 100% of the time. Not picking and choosing which ones we're going to follow today and which ones we're not going to follow today. That's not professionalism. Now I'm going to make the fire chief uncomfortable. What fire chief is going to go on TV and say, look, if your home does not have working smoke detectors in it, the chances of us saving you are not very good. And if your home doesn't have residential sprinklers in it, the chances of us saving your stuff isn't very good. The fire service is designed to stop conflagration. If we save somebody, if we make that dramatic save, you've all seen the picture when the mom or dad was dropping the baby out of the third floor window and the female firefighter running at full speed, her helmet was off, but she just caught the kid as the kid dropped. Fire blowing out the apartment windows. Somebody was trying to put a ladder up. <laughs> just caught the kid as they dropped. That, when we save somebody, we save somebody by chance. That's, I know we have all that training. You have all the training in the world. You're good at it. But it was by chance that she was there. Chance 
a profession cannot be based on chance. We know how to fix it. We can need to change from manual to automatic fire protection. Do we have the courage to do it? We can learn, but we're slow to learn. You remember the uh, station nightclub fire? That happened 15 years ago. Just, just this year, when the, President Trump signed the, uh, the tax code change, one of those tax code changes was to let small businesses write off retrofitting sprinkler systems in one year, as opposed to 25 years or something like that. That was the big accomplishment that took 15 years from this fire. That was the legislation that was just, just passed to allow owners to retrofit their building and write off the cost of it in a year as opposed to a 15 year or something like that. So there's a tax benefit for now people, small business owners to go back and retrofit sprinklers into their buildings. That's a good thing, but it took 15 years and 100 people died. What I also find fascinating are the criminal and civil settlements out of that fire. The owners, there were brothers, one got 15 years, served four, 11 years suspended, three years probation. The other brother got 10 years suspended, three years probation, 500 hours of community. But I really think this is interesting. There were $115 million in fines spread out over 11 companies as a result of that fire. Some of the companies were amazing. For example, the state of Rhode Island and the city of Warwick had to pay $10 million because they didn't follow their own fire prevention codes at the state level or local level. Um, I find this interesting too. The TV station. If you remember the fire, there was a TV cameraman in there. That's why we have the inside video of that fire. It's horrifying to watch. But he was filming standing in the exit way. And they accused him of blocking the exit. So the TV station had to pay $30 million. The beer company that sponsored it was $21 million. The soundproofing that made the, the plastic and stuff, $25 million. And the radio station, I don't know what the radio station did. I guess they were broadcasting it or advertising it. They, they paid $22 million. <laughs> I read a, a comment that says, if you think safety is expensive, accidents are more expensive. This certainly goes to prove it. This is why we need boardrooms and sitting in here. We need boardrooms sitting in here. Here's my pet peeve, seat belts. Now, I want to give you attaboys. Out of boys and out of girls. At one time, when I was still running the program before it was turned over to the Fallen Firefighters Foundation, uh, I kept track of the states. And at one time, North Carolina had 218 fire departments that had received their 100% seatbelt certificate. You were the number one state in the whole country. So congratulations to you. I, they don't do it that way anymore, so I don't know what the data is now. But you can see where they had some of the most. The two biggest cities that had done it were Dallas and Atlanta, both of those major metropolitan fire departments, they had gotten everybody to take the seatbelt pledge. So we still haven't solved that simple problem of seatbelts. Uh, they, they still do have the website, so you can still do the seatbelt kind of stuff. They do it a different way now, but, but it's still out there and still something hopefully we can get this problem solved because obviously we didn't do it for the North Carolina firefighter. So we're getting close to the conclusion. In the 20th century, the American Fire culture has been basically a manual fire protection model. My career is over. I was part of the 20th century. You guys, you're going to be mostly in the 21st century. If it's still a manual fire protection when you retire, shame on you. Shame on you. But hopefully we'll move closer to an automatic built-in fire protection model. That's your charge. That's going to be more successful than any fire truck you ride on if you can change society to an automatic built-in fire protection model. Because you're going to be the expert, you need to tell the truth. We couldn't do it in the 20th, in the 20th century. You can do it in the 21st century. Because automatic built-in fire protection is the best way to fight fire and save lives. If you say, I fight fire and save lives, riding on a fire truck 
is not the best way to do that. And it's the best way to be a real firefighter. I think I'm a firefighter standing here today, but I'm too old to put gear on. I couldn't get back up if I got that on the ground. But if I can convince you guys to put your seatbelt on, if I can convince your elected official to be a little more sympathetic when we try to get residential sprinklers or do stuff, then we're going in the right direction. Um, this is one of my heroes. Anybody know what this picture is? Tank Man. That's the guy in China, Tiananmen Square, when they were going to go in and, and, and attack the students that were protesting, he went out in the middle of the street and stopped and stopped the rogue tanks. Now, the problem is, we don't know if he's disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. You know, so st stand, standing up in China, I don't know. But sometimes I feel like that. But at the same time, if you're familiar with this, Silent Spring by uh, Rachel Carlson, she was the one that first talked about pesticides. It's a 50 years old now, but we're a lot healthier today because she wrote a book about the Silent Spring and the problem associated with pesticides. It started the, the Environmental Protection Agency and all the stuff that we have today. So one person can make a difference. You all can make a difference. Whether you're the rookie firefighter, the fire chief, the council member, whatever, you can do stuff to make us safer, to make your own family safer. Two, two final stories. This happened the 4th of July. My daughter, she's not a young woman, she's 50. She's got three kids, they're all grown. Her daughter has two kids, my great-grandkids. So my daughter says, hey, let's, let's go to breakfast this morning. I said, okay. So without thinking, I get in the car with her. She says, look up the address. So I'm looking up the address. I put my seatbelt on, we leave. And I realize, oh, shit. My daughter refuses to wear her seatbelt. She refuses to wear her seatbelt. It's her right. She, we get into arguments. It's her right. I normally do not ride with her in the car because she doesn't wear a seatbelt. And but when she's in my car, she usually doesn't ride with me either because I won't move my car if she doesn't put her seatbelt on. But now I'm stuck because we started moving and I wasn't paying attention. She doesn't have her seatbelt on. So we're going to go pick up her friend and then we're going to go to breakfast. So we stopped the car, and I put my hand, I put my hand on her hand on a gear shift, and I said, Sam, I want to tell you. I said, Sam, would you please? She said, don't tell me to put my seatbelt on. I'm not going to put my seatbelt So she goes off. She goes off on me about not wearing a seatbelt. She gets out of the car, huffing, puffing, going to the girlfriend to get her. So now I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. So it's one of those minutes, one of those moments. You have to put up or shut up. This is my tank man moment. Right? She gets back in her car with her friend. I said, Sam, I can't be in a car with you. I'm going to call somebody to give me a ride home. And I got out of the car. I started walking to this corner where I could get a ride home. A couple months later, she pulls up with her seatbelt on. She says, get in, damn it. Get in, damn it. So, so she put her seatbelt on. I have to remember, don't get in her car with her. But if you can imagine, here I am. I'm an adult. She's an adult. I can't spank her, you know. I. But what? 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 What decision do I have to make? That's not going to change the world. No, it's not going to change the world. But if you make a commitment to do something, what are you willing to do about it? I mean, that's that's the hard stuff. I was out visiting her daughter, which is my granddaughter, and my two great grandkids. I get to visit the house. I look at the smoke detectors. And they're taking, they were AC powered smoke detectors, and they were obviously they were they were taken off. They were not there. I said, what happened to smoke detectors? They said, well, they're always going off. We didn't get a chance to fix them yet. I said, what? In the car we went, off to Home Depot, got smoke detectors, and put them in for them. So that's I can come do this. This is great. I may help something, but then you have to decide every day what you're going to do to live your values, to live what you say is important, to make the right decisions. And it's tough. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I think you can make a difference. So here's the final question. What will you do? What will you do? I don't know what you're going to do. I wrote a book. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs>